Hello everyone, thank you for being there. Malcolm Noble welcoming you to the second in a series of podcasts about the history of English detective fiction. And this evening we're going to be talking about the Collins Crime Club. The History of English Detective Fiction is a fortnightly podcast tracing the genre from 1920 until the proliferation of post-war television, let's say 1960. It won't be an A to Z gazette here, nor a strict chronology, but will bounce around different subjects of interest. Please don't forget to rate it on your listening platform, and I hope you enjoy tonight's podcast. The Collins Crime Club had a predominant influence on English detective fiction through the 1930s and 40s. Its commitment to quality was such that sometimes it seemed to be guiding public taste rather than responding to it. But it wasn't a book club in the normal sense of the word. Readers who applied to join were simply adding their names to a mailing list. They received a quarterly newsletter giving them advanced information about each month's crime novels from Collins Publisher. It was at that time Collins' habit to publish three crime novels on the first week of each month. The Crime Club Committee, chaired by Dr Cyril Allington, the former headmaster of uh, Eton College and uh, soon to become a Dean of Durham, selected one of the titles and recommended another two. And it was up to the readers to decide whether they wanted to make a purchase or not. They didn't buy from the club. They simply went down to their local bookshop or library and ordered a title. And of course, Collins made sure that the bookshops and libraries were expecting requests. So it was a very smart marketing tool. People signed up as a crime fiction fan and they received news of good quality books. But its success depended on more than simply matching the right books to the right people at the right time. The Collins Crime Club took off at a time when the publishing house was reorganising, restructuring and revitalising itself. Collins was already an established Scottish publishing house with over 100 years of history. Its reputation was founded largely on Bibles, educational and children's material, but it was very open to the business opportunities of popular fiction. In fact, the first quarter of the 20th century was so successful that they decided to enhance their London operation. They appointed Sid Goldsack as their sales manager. He'd already done a good job for them as their American representative. And most importantly, Roy Pollitz had developed a role in publicity and book promotion. So, with Thomas Gree still in charge of production, Collins was well able to make the most of their new idea. The Collins Crime Club opened for business on the 6th of May 1930, and within a year had 20,000 subscribers. It went up to 25,000 in 1934. Of course, the Collins Crime Club did not have a clear field. Hodder and Stoughton, with their distinctive yellow dust jackets, Victor Galantz again with a style of their own, McDonald's and Jenkins all had significant crime lifts in their catalogue. And personally, I've rarely been failed by a crime novel published by McDonald's between the wars. But none of these publishers could match the Collins Crime Club for their stable of authors or their knack of corporate identity. I was always a bit concerned by the device which they used on their title pages and some of their spines of a hooded figure holding a gun. It seemed very un-English to me and much more suitable for horror stories. However, it did not deter the legion of crime club fanatics. Nowadays, collectors especially look out for any ephemera to do with the club, not just the newsletters, they are very much sought after, uh, but also the wraparound jackets, the postcards and the flyers. There was even a card game, although it was produced, curiously, not by Collins, but by Peeps. It was the austerity of the Second World War which really damaged the club. And in the summer of 1942, they announced that they would no longer be issuing their newsletter. 
Without the newsletter, what was the point of being on the mailing list? The club effectively became what it had always essentially been, an imprint of a major publishing house. Under the label of the crime club, Collins went on collecting new authors throughout the 50s, but it was not really the crime club of the old days. Eventually, Collins became part of HarperCollins, and in uh, 1994, when it was part of the Rupert Murdoch empire, the Collins Crime Club issued its last title. Let's try and illustrate just how successful the crime club was. Before they launched the imprint, Collins were already successful at selling crime fiction. They've sold uh, Freeman Wills Croft The Cask and Agatha Christie's The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, both bestsellers. But when they launched the Collins Crime Club, their first title was Philip MacDonald's The Noose. His sales outstripped the publisher's expectation fourfold. And with that sort of draw, that sort of success, major names were soon seeking out Collins as their publishers of choice. Within a very few months of starting the crime club, Collins was receiving 300 crime manuscripts a month. After the First World War, a new readership for detective fiction was developing in England throughout the 20s and 30s, and the Collins Crime Club is a fine illustration of how innovative the publishing houses were in trying to capture that new audience. But more than that, so many big names wrote for the crime club that any chronology of English detective fiction is bound to reflect the chronology of the Collins Crime Club. Here are a few of the names. Agatha Christie, Anthony Gilbert, Elizabeth Ferrers, John Rode, Richard Hull, Shelley Smith, ECR Lorrock, Ethel Lena White, Rex Stout, Nicholas Blake, Nio Marsh. At its height, the Collins Crime Club was producing 42 novels a year, and customers knew that they could rely on it for a good, literate read. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to episode two of A History of English Detective Fiction. I hope that the podcast has added a little something to your cloak and dagger reading. I also want to thank YouTube for the royalty free audio. This podcast was posted on the 6th of November and I expect to upload episode 3 in two weeks time on the 20th of November. At the moment I'm thinking of speaking about the Donish school of detective fiction but who knows I might have changed my mind before we get there. My name is Malcolm Noble, my website is malcolmnoble.com, please take a look at it. Once again thank you for listening and all that remains is for me to wish you a very good evening and God bless.